Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. Bismillah, wassalatu wassalam, rasulullah, wa barak. The name of Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his messenger as to what follows. Family, friends, and foes, and haters and homies, I welcome you again. And thank you for joining me. You're all welcome, those who love me, those who hate me. <laughs> I receive you all in love and serenity, void of all hatred. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and mercy and blessings of Allah be upon all of you, regardless if you like me or not. <laughs> okay. And before I begin, I humbly ask that you please hit the like button and please hit the share and subscribe button. Barakallah feekum. May Allah reward all of you. And please don't forget to support this channel on Patreon. As you guys know, I do put quite a bit of research into these videos and editing. And it's, it's a lot of work to present these things for you. And... Uh, and I put a lot of love as well. I mean, I'm just being real. So I humbly ask <laughs> that you please support me on Patreon. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, with the situation with uh, Omar Suleiman and the podcast that was done with, uh, with uh, the brother John Fontaine. So I'm just going to give you some background first before I get, like, dig right in. Right? So... The brother John, he asked me, you know, after he did the the podcast with Abu Toba and, and uh, Umar, uh, Abu Omar, right? He asked me, "What did I think?" I said, and I said, I thought it was really good. I thought it was nice, but, and I told him this, and those of you who know him, you can ask him. I told him, but uh, the youth are going to be confused by it. They're not going to understand it because there's a generation gap. Now, why am I bringing this up? I want to explain to you why us, the older brothers, understand things differently than the younger brothers and why we say things to you the way that we do so that you can take this in holistically. And then I'm going to get into why um, uh, Wajdi, Wajdi, brother Wajdi Akurami, his uh, his uh, video against uh, Abu Toba and Abu Umar and uh, the brother John was uh, was what was absolutely atrocious, and it was just not good at all. And I'm going to bring all the receipts, so just be patient with me for a little bit, so I can give you a little talk first. I remember rotary phones, <laughs> okay? <laughs> what, what does the rotary phones have to do with all this? You know, back in the day, I remember having to use these rotary phones, and if you wanted to call somebody, you have to do this thing. You know what I mean? You, you ha if you, you memorize people's numbers, and if you wanted to have contact with somebody, you have to go with them face to face. You understand? And back in those days, <clears throat> when we would listen to one of our scholars or our teachers, or whatever, we would have to sit down and actually listen to entire lectures, sometimes two hours, three hours. And we wouldn't have any issue with that, just sitting down and listening and taking notes. Back in those days, we would have no problems with that whatsoever. And what happened was, in our time, what we have, we have these things, okay? This is not a rotary phone. This is a smartphone. What does that have to do with anything? You see, what happens with the younger generation is that when they watch these videos and they see something on Facebook or Instagram or whatnot, they themselves, they have the opportunity to engage. So instead of just directly listening and taking in and taking notes, 
what they do is they go into instant comment mode. You understand what I'm saying? We didn't have that back then. We didn't have the opportunity to make commentary on one of our teachers or our elder statements. We, could, we couldn't do it because we didn't have these. So if you have those and you're watching something and you don't understand what the person says, what this gives you the opportunity to do now is to comment without actually seeking clarification. You get me? And then what this does, it, it causes a chain reaction because somebody else sees the comment and that comment now is implanted into the, the psyche of that person. And now that comment becomes the idea of that person and so on and so on. We didn't have that back then. This disrespect of the elders, this door was kicked wide open by Abu Khadija, uh, uh, Abu Alam, <laughs> Alam, this guy from Salafi Publications. He was the first person to break down this door. Okay? He started doing it um, in the UK by himself against Shuaib Hassan and these people out there in the UK. And he started doing it against um, Bilal Phillips here. He's the one who broke this door open. And since that door has been open, this door has not been able to be shut. What does this have to do with anything? The amount of disrespect. Yes, yeah, Salam. The amount of disrespect that Wajdi al Akrami showed Abu Toba, who is his elder in age and in knowledge is absolutely ridiculous. But let's even move past the disrespect part now. Because this disease that this uh, young, younger generation has inherited from that era, that mid-2000s era, you know, that's the Islam that they learned from, and this is directly from Spubs. This type of... Um, uh, you know, if you don't believe what, how we believe, if you don't accept how we accept, then there is something wrong with you. I'm telling you, in the 90s, we were not like that. This did not happen. This did not happen. We couldn't think to disrespect our elders like that. We couldn't think to disrespect uh, the scholars like that. It just wasn't in us. This door was opened by Abu Khadija himself. And that door has not been closed since. So I'm hoping through these series of videos to shut that door once and for all, inshallah. That's what I'm hoping. I wasn't going to get involved in this at all, this Omar Suleiman, Daniel Kikuchu thing at all. You know, once I actually, let me track backtrack a little bit i thought about it and i started gathering evidence but when i seen all these people talking about it, i said let me stay out of this this is fitna this is fitna but some of you remember that last year uh when i started these videos why did i start it was because shemsi opened a door <laughs> right he opened the door to Fitna that I that wasn't open before. And that was when he went after Haji and uh, Ali Dawa. And there caused a massive split of thousands of Muslims within seconds, just like that. Just like that. This never happened in the past. So when I saw the video, Ya Noor, when I saw this video, I knew right away because of the way that the younger generation engages, how they engage. I knew that they just wouldn't get it. They wouldn't understand it. it has nothing to do with um, Abu Toba. He articulated himself well. But the way that the younger 
generation perceives information because they grew up on these. I knew that there's going to be massive misunderstandings. The, the younger generation, they live in a world of clips. Everything has to be quick and has to be clipped. You understand? They can't take um, long, large bits of information and uh, decipher it holistically because they want this instant gratification of everything is now. And it's not their fault. It doesn't mean that they're they're unintelligent or anything like this. No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that they have, um, they've developed this type of lack of patience because everything to them is now, now, now. They have to have the information now, right now. And we were not like that back then. If, if a sheikh or um, a scholar or something said something, we would just listen, take notes, and that was it. If a scholar was having this, a dispute with another scholar, we would not involve ourselves in it. When Sheikh Albani or Allah and Sheikh Huthaymin and Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Mukbu were going at it over, um, whatchamacallit, the uh, Desert Storm in 1990, we did not involve ourselves in that fitna. Not like now you have in 2020, Muslims are up in arms over Omar Suleiman and Daniel Kikitu. There's a disconnect there. How? How is this disconnect? It's because of social media. And if you look at my videos, if you watch my videos in the past, you know, you know how I talk about the dangers of social media. It's extremely dangerous. It's not even a joke. And you know how I explained that even the government themselves, they put out, they pay money to people and they pay people to write articles to cause confusion amongst the Muslims. And we don't know who is who and who is doing what. We don't, we can't know that. So somebody might be feeding information in the community and the community reacts to it predictably, predictably enough because they haven't actually followed the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu but they think they are by defending the religion, and they have it, and that causes even more confusion. So, going into what happened with Wajdi, if I was to tell you guys, you know, don't make salah anymore. You can't make salah. The first thing you're going to ask me is, why? Why can't we make salah? You know, everybody knows to make salah. And I say, because if I tell you, because Allah will punish you if you make salah. You're going to say, Allah is going to punish us to making salah? What's your proof? And then I say, because Allah says in the Quran, for why you musallina. Okay, that Allah says in the Quran, this is a full ayah in Surah Al Ma'un, right? And woe unto those people who make salah. Then what will you say? You will say that I have taken this ayah out of context. Correct? But how do we know that I have taken this ayah out of context? Because it is a complete ayah in the Quran. How do you know that I'm wrong? Allah says, for Musallin, you shouldn't make, you know, woe to those who make salah. Therefore, I, in my mind, my context is don't make salah. But what you will say, you have to read the ayat afterwards. And what's the ayat afterwards? Alladheena hum an salatihim sahoon. Right? That's the ayat afterwards. <laughs> right? 
the ayah afterwards is those who delay the salat from their fixed times. Not just anybody, any old Joe making salat. No, those who delay from making their salat at the fixed times. Those who do good deeds just to be seen by other people. That is the context. You can't just make a statement without grabbing the context. So there's two things going on here. The first thing is, how does one get context? There's two ways you can get context. Either you can extrapolate the context directly from whatever it is you're reading, whatever it is you're listening to, whatever it is you're watching, you extrapolate the context directly. Or you interpolate the context. Meaning, you use your mind and put a context into that, whatever it is, from your mind. This is what Wajdi did throughout almost two hours of that video. The entire time, he was interpolating context. This is a very old Orientalist trick. It's nothing new. And it really doesn't require much talent. Anybody can do what um, Wajdi did. Anybody with a camera and a microphone and a YouTube account can do exactly what Wajdi did to anybody else. Uh, two hours of red herrings, just throwing red herrings for, and, and red like this, catch, 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 like catch all these red herrings. So how do we know? How can you make such a claim? Ya Bilal. Well, let's go to one of the many matters, okay? And I mean many <laughs> matters in which the brother Wajdi al-Akari interpolated context into the words of uh, the brother Abu Toba. One such example is the statement. Now, remember, we said in the Quran, Fawaidul Musallin, right? If I say, well, Fawaidul Musallin, and woe be unto those performers of the Salat, again, you either interpolate context or you extrapolate context. Either you put the context in or you take the context out. So, Abu Toba says, Memorize the Quran or shut up. That's the statement right here. So let's leave Abu Toba out of it. Let's leave Wajdi Akhri out of it. Let's just take the statement by itself. Memorize Quran and shut up. Or shut up. We either or whatever. It doesn't make a difference. And or. We'll use both. Okay. Memorize the Quran or shut up. If I just take this statement by itself, either I'm interpolating context or I'm extrapolating context, right? Memorize Quran and shut up, it could mean anything. I could be talking to my kids. They could be, I don't know, messing around in the bedroom and when they're supposed to be memorizing Quran. And I tell them, hey you, my children, memorize Quran and shut up. Memorize Quran or shut up. You know, we can be in a masjid, you know, and uh, the the teacher can be around the kids or whatever. He's like, memorize Quran or shut up. Now, this is me interpolating context into memorize Quran or shut up. So what is the context that Wajdi said that this phrase, memorize Quran or shut up, uh, that, that he said, right? What he said that is uh, Abu Toba's intention. He said, memorize Quran or shut up, meaning 
that you cannot make dawah unless you memorize Quran. That's his understanding of memorize Quran or shut up. So I'm asking, where did he get this context? Did he get it from Abu Toba himself or did he get it from his mind and interpolate that context into it? And when you look at the video, at the time step, which he himself said that uh, is Abu Toba saying, memorize the Quran and shut up. You will see that Abu Toba, he's telling a story. Okay? And the story consists of him studying in Egypt. And the Sheikh, he's having some problems with some of the students from the West. He's telling them to memorize Quran, and these students want to learn Masail. You know, why do they want to learn Masail? Because they want to get in, involved in these issues, these refutation issues. And what does the Sheikh say? He says, memorize the Quran or shut up. I'm saying that's the context. Let's look and see who is closer to what Abu Toba said. According to him, anybody, uh, these are his words. If he feels otherwise, please next time use different words so that I don't have to criticize and then you have to reply and we go back and forth playing ping pong. From the beginning, articulate and choose your words. I don't look at, please, if you understand English differently, they don't tell me this is American slang, African-American slang. This is clear language anyone who speaks English understands. I don't look at nobody who ain't finished the Quran. You've memorized 29 Jews. You need to keep your mouth shut until you get that 30th Jews. Don't look at this person. That person is non-existent. He's not there. He's not on the map to begin with. Who did he learn this from? Sheikh Badawi. Until he says, memorize the Quran or shut up. Wallahi, go watch the, epi watch the episode yourself. He says, memorize the Quran or shut up. And that word shut up was used a good five, six times in this podcast, which I find to be offensive, I would say the least, to any other da'i involved there for you to come and tell us to shut up. I went through the durus and, and listened to Sheikh Fawzan. I can put the link in the description. And Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, they were asked about who can give da'wah, who cannot give da'wah. None of them said that you have to memorize the Quran. They all say that you have to have knowledge to that which you're inviting to. You have to know the halal and the haram. You have to do it ala basira. You have to be sincere. They mentioned what you need to have. We all know them. Everybody involved in da'wah knows what al-amr bil ma'roof wa al munkar is. Ain't nobody made it a prerequisite for you to memorize the whole book of Allah. Not that we're discouraging people from doing so, but you can't come make a prerequisite on your own and then impose it on us and then dismiss everybody who hasn't met it. And then within the same sentence, you make an exception to your homie. You know, so you get there and the first thing, like he said, the Sheikh, I know the Sheikh, I met him, right? He's the one who told me, come. And it's first day I arrived, I go meet the Sheikh at Fajr. Says, you're here now, how is the travel? Good. So how much Quran do you have? She said the same thing. So how much Quran do you have? You memorize the Quran? Mm -hmm. I was like, no, Sheikh, you know, there's still seven Jews. Speak up, man, I can't hear you. Know, there's still seven Jews, eight Jews left, you know. And I'm trying to talk the way I talk to the Sheikh, you know, because like you talk about the Haiba, the respect, you meet the man, you know, like you, you are at your place. Mm. He said, okay, then that's where we started. Nothing else. Same thing he told me. Nothing else. See, when I got there, he, there just had been a bunch of Americans who had left, who had come with this rah-rah, and they had really upset the Sheikh because they wanted to learn Masail, they said. And this is what the Sheikh said. They wanted to learn issues, which means jump around. And he said, I have 30 Hufav here. And I don't know how many people there, but he says, I have 30 Hufav here. I can assign each one of you, one person, to memorize the Book of Allah. Nobody wanted to. So he told them to leave the village. There was actually only one American family that was living right on the outskirts of the town there. And they actually left too, because they weren't studying there with the Sheikh at all. So they eventually left. So that's why I got to study with the Sheikh, because he was like, well, Oh, yeah, you can? You just study with me then. You know, so, I mean, it's a good deal, you know, 20 years later. But at the time, 
you know, I was very intimidated. Hmm. You know, you're going, you're going to be intimidated, especially now when he says that, yeah, bro, and what he means is there's nothing else for you. You haven't memorized the Quran. You don't have the qualifications. To study anything. Jesus. Start studying. Yeah, no. What? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't so, so study. So let me stop right there. So let's. I think the people don't understand. When I come out and I say I don't look at nobody that ain't finished the Quran. You ain't no scholar. I get that from Sheikh Abdullah Din Bedouin because he, you know, that's just one share. Same thing with the Shiuk in Mauritania and with Shiuk in different places. And when, when Sheikh Alabani wouldn't shake Sheikh away in his hand because he hadn't finished Quran yet. And he went back and finished in six months, but then the Sheikh Rahmatullah had passed away and he cried over that. It was a famous story in, in, in Al Khafra Sheikh in, in Egypt. So the ulama we were around were like, you don't. I was around Sheikh Abdul Aziz C. Rahimullah. In Mauritania, he's the judge of the capital, Nuraksha. And he said, I'm about to kick you out this country for being so ignorant, thinking that you need to learn the whole Arab, learn Alafiyah before you finish the Quran, Alafiyah to Gunamalik mm. in language, and you haven't finished the Quran. Mm. And we said, Sheikh, but we didn't understand what it means. And he said, It's an issue of Iman. So that's the background of we, we come out boldly and say, no, man, memorize the Quran first or shut up. So dear listener, the ones who love me and the ones who hate me, <laughs> I ask you honestly, who was closer to the context of what Sheikh Abu Toba was saying? Was it myself or was it Brother Wajdi? And let's be honest. The Sheikh was talking about if you are a scholar, or if I'm a scholar, or if I'm a student knowledge rather, and I am seeking knowledge from the scholar, I'm seeking knowledge from the scholar, and the scholar puts a condition, if you want to sit with me and seek knowledge, you must memorize the Quran or shut up. And he explained it beautifully, actually. Here comes Wajdi <laughs> saying, how can you tell the du'at that they can't make da'wah until they memorize the Quran? Who here is extrapolating the context and who here is interpolating the context? I leave that for you to answer. Listen to Wajdi's entire two, almost two hour, you know, Orientalist style refutation. Listen to the whole thing. And then go and watch the podcast with, uh, with uh, Abu Toba and, and uh, Abu Umar. And then you tell me where through that entire podcast that either Abu Toba or Abu Umar ever said you are not allowed to make da'wah until you memorize the entire Quran. I challenge all of you, put it in the, con in the comments, leave the timestamp. And it's easy for us to make excuses for each other. You know, we could say, for example, maybe the brother Wajdi Akari, he had uh, suha fahm, as they say in Arabic. Suha fahm is like a, a misunderstanding or, you know what I mean? Like he didn't, he didn't actually grasp, you know, or he might have made a mistake. It's easy for us to make it, uh, an excuse for our brother. But if it's, if the entire video is like that, the whole video from beginning to end is like that it gets more and more difficult to make excuses. You know, as the old saying goes, something's rotten in Denmark. So I leave, I leave you to answer that question. I'm not gonna answer it for you. Don't believe me, go back, listen to both. I left the, both the clips up there for you. Check it out. And this is just part one. Inshallah, I'll come up with part two 
uh, tomorrow. And don't forget to please like, subscribe, share. Please support me on Patreon. This is this is like <laughs> you know, it's again going through this stuff. It takes time. And I came to you in love and serenity and peace. And I leave you the same way, the same way, okay? There's no hatred in my heart for any one of you. Subhanakallah bihamdak wa shadu an la ilaha illa ant wa staffaka wa tubi ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon you all. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and uh, <laughs> hit me up on Patreon. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, the white people really passed meaningful laws. It would not be necessary to pass any more laws. There are already enough laws on the law books to protect an American citizen. You only need uh, additional laws when you're dealing with someone who is not regarded as an American citizen. But whites are so hypocritical. They don't want to admit that this black man is not a citizen. Uh, so they classify him as a, a second-class citizen to, uh, to get around uh, making him a real citizen. If he was a real citizen, you'd need no more laws. You'd need no civil rights legislation. Uh, civil rights, uh, when you have civil rights, you have citizenship. It's automatic. White people don't need laws to protect their citizenship because they're citizens. But they, want, they, uh, they don't want to tell us we're not citizens. And at the same time, they don't want to pass laws that are meaningful enough to protect us as if we were citizens. And the Supreme Court desegregation decision is the best example I know. That's a law from the Supreme Court. Ten years have gone by. No, no desegregated schools. The, it hasn't been implemented beyond, I think, 9% in ten years. So this just shows you the hypocrisy of the American white man. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. And uh, for this reason, we who are Muslims, that is, who believe in the religion of Islam, who believe in God, we don't believe that black people will ever get any laws, get any problem with laws being passed or uh, new persons being put in office, uh, white liberals being put in office. There is nothing that the white man will ever do to bring about uh, true, sincere uh, citizenship or civil rights recognition for black people in this country. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory with no victory. Uh, it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you are trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain, practical gain, that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years.